I don't know how this isn't trending right now, but the story of the Titanic's tragic demise might hold more secrets than we ever imagined. While the tale of its sinking has been immortalized in countless films, documentaries, and miniseries, whispers of something more sinister than the iceberg collision persist. Could the unsinkable ship have been brought down by factors far darker than nature's icy grasp? With survivors' accounts hinting at potentially more nefarious causes, we're diving deep into the mystery that still surrounds one of the most captivating stories ever told. This video examines these claims questioning the long-held belief that an iceberg was solely responsible for the Titanic's doom. Chapter 7. J.P. Morgan's Plan J.P. Morgan, a name that still resonates with power in the world of finance, earned his nickname the Napoleon of Wall Street not through flashy displays but through shrewd business moves and an iron grip on the financial world. He played a key role in the rise of American industrial giants like General Electric United States Steel and International Harvester, and when the American banking system teetered on the brink during the Panic of 1907, it was Morgan with his deep pockets and even deeper influence who stepped in and steered the country back from the edge. But Morgan's reach extended far beyond Wall Street. He was also a titan of the shipping industry owning the International Mercantile Marine Company, which in turn controlled the White Star Line. The White Star Line was the proud owner of that magnificent ill-fated vessel, the Titanic. It's no surprise that Morgan's name would come up when whispers about the Titanic sinking and shadowy motives began to swirl. J.P. Morgan had even attended the Titanic's grand launch in 1911 marveling at the ship's luxurious amenities. In fact, he'd splurged on a personal suite for the maiden voyage, a private haven with a promenade deck and a bathtub boasting custom-made cigar holders talk about luxury. But something surprising happened just before the big day. Morgan had a change of heart opting instead to stay at a posh French resort and indulge in relaxing massages and soothing sulfur baths. This last-minute switch, of course, could he have known something the rest of U.S. didn't? That the supposedly unsinkable ship was actually doomed. Conspiracy theories sprung up like weeds whispering of Morgan's inside knowledge and his clever escape from disaster. However, these theories haven't held much water with Titanic experts. Folks like George B. Don Lynch and Ray Leppin have presented more plausible explanations for Morgan's change of plans. Perhaps business obligations cropped up, or maybe just maybe he simply decided he'd rather soak in baths than brave the Atlantic. So while the Titanic's demise remains a tragic chapter, Morgan's last-minute change of plans is best understood as a personal choice. Ready for more? Smash that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a beat. Let's make every day more amazing than the last. Chapter 6. The Titanic was switched? The year was 1912. The world held its breath as the mighty Titanic sank beneath the icy waves of the North Atlantic. This wasn't supposed to happen. This ship was dubbed unsinkable, yet it lay broken and cold in the depths. But in recent years, a whisper has emerged from the shadows of the internet, a story so unbelievable it tickles the edges of our fascination. What if it wasn't the Titanic that sank? What if it was another ship, a clever imposter that met its watery end? It's a juicy tidbit, isn't it? Insurance scams and ship swaps, it all sounds like something out of a movie, and that is part of the draw. We humans love a good mystery, especially when it involves the rich and powerful. So it's no surprise that this theory claiming the Titanic was actually the Olympic another White Star Line ship has gained some traction. See back in 1911, the Olympic met with trouble during a voyage from England to New York. It collided with a warship which damaged its hull. It sailed back to Belfast, its home port, for repairs after getting patched up. The Olympic continued its journey, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. It needed further repairs in March 1912, just weeks before the Titanic was due to make its maiden voyage. Some reckon that the people in charge, maybe the shipping company or some shadowy figures, decided the Olympic was too badly damaged to make money anymore, so they hatched a crazy plan to switch it with the brand new Titanic. They imagined they could sink the damaged ship and collect a big fat insurance payout. Who cares if people died, right? However, there are a few major cracks in this theory. Experts like Kent Layton, who wrote a whole book about seafaring conspiracies, point out that the Titanic's insurance wouldn't even cover the cost of replacing the Olympic, let alone make them rich, so even if they swapped the ships, it wouldn't have been a profitable scheme. Gareth Russell, a British historian who has studied the Titanic for years, doesn't mince words when it comes to this theory. He thinks it's so far-fetched, so utterly implausible, that it's almost funny. Why? Well, for starters, the Titanic and the Olympic weren't just sisters, they were practically twins. They looked similar, sure, but inside they were different. 
different layouts, different decorations, and even different engines. Swapping them in a secret week-long operation would be like trying to sneak a giraffe into a zebra costume. It wouldn't work not even close. People on board from the captain to the crew would have noticed something fishy right away. Russell points out that if the owners really wanted to collect insurance, they could have just accidentally damaged the ship while it was docked. Maybe a small fire something contained and believable. That way they get the money without putting anyone in danger or risking a giant iceberg in the middle of the ocean. Much less messy, much less morally reprehensible. So while the idea of a sneaky ship swap might sound like something out of a spy movie, the reality is far less glamorous. The evidence just doesn't add up. The Curse of the Mummy, one of the many lives lost on the Titanic, belonged to William Stead, a famous British editor with a head full of fascinating and sometimes strange ideas. Unlike most, Stead wasn't just concerned with earthly matters. He was a big believer in strange things in spirits and messages from beyond the grave. In fact, a few years before the Titanic sank, he had been convinced that a grumpy cursed mummy lurking in the British Museum was responsible for a string of bad luck plaguing London. Fires, accidents, and even the weather seemed to bend to the ancient artifact's will. According to Stead, this wasn't just his quirky personal belief. Back then, many folks, especially those in powerful positions, had a tendency to blame misfortune on the people whose lands they had conquered. Mysterious happenings in places like Egypt or Native American burial grounds were often chalked up to angry spirits seeking revenge. It was an easy way to explain the unexplainable and a convenient way to dismiss the voices and concerns of those whose cultures and lands had been disrupted. Now, as the Titanic sailed towards its fateful encounter with the iceberg William Stead, the enthusiastic editor with a penchant for the paranormal couldn't resist regaling fellow passengers with his latest theory, The Curse of the Vengeful Mummy. His captivating tales of the ancient artifact's wrath, supposedly responsible for London's recent misfortunes, were a welcome distraction from the monotony of the long voyage. Little did anyone know that these chilling stories would take on a new tragic dimension after the unthinkable happened. When the Titanic met its icy demise, one survivor managed to reach New York and recount Stead's chilling tales to the press. The media hungry for any angle on the disaster devoured the story. Newspapers across the country splashed sensational headlines across their front pages, weaving a spooky narrative about the mummy's revenge. The narrative spoke of an ancient Egyptian princess preserved as a mummy who brought misfortune wherever she went after being dug up from her tomb. The mummy was said to have caused a string of deaths and disasters across the country. Frightened by the curse, British art collectors and museum workers desperately wanted to get rid of the mummy. An adventurous American archaeologist saw the whole thing as a thrilling opportunity. Ignoring his colleagues' warnings about the mummy's wrath, he bought the artifact and set sail for New York eager to study his prize. But fate had other plans. The archaeologist along with his cursed cargo boarded none other than the RMS Titanic. The spooky story of the cursed mummy sailing off on the Titanic might make for a chilling campfire tale, but in reality it's all wet. Turns out the unlucky mummy everyone blames is still safely tucked away in the British Museum where it's been for over a century. No ancient mummy hitched a ride on the doomed ship despite what some folks might say. That hasn't stopped some people from blaming the mummy for the ship's tragic end. The legend seems to have a life of its own even without any evidence to back it up. It seems some folks prefer a good ghost story over the cold hard facts. Chapter 5. Sunk by a German U-boat? The Titanic sinking still ranks as one of history's worst maritime disasters. This colossal tragedy happened just two years before the First World War erupted causing some to whisper a darker possibility. Did a German U-boat, a type of stealthy underwater warship, actually send the unsinkable ship to its doom? If this theory were true, it would change the story of the Titanic dramatically. It wouldn't just be a tragic accident, but a deliberate act of violence, an omen of the brutal warfare to come. After all, in 1915, just three years later, a German U-boat would torpedo the Lusitania, another British ocean liner, killing over 1,000 people. The similarities spark suspicion. The Titanic's icy tomb lay undisturbed for decades until a team of explorers finally located it in 1985 nestled deep in the Atlantic. The ship's right side or starboard was firmly lodged in the seabed. This was the same side that had met its fatal match with an iceberg off Newfoundland 73 years earlier on April 14, 1912. 
using special technology subprofiles peered into the sunken vessel's hull. Their digital images revealed a chilling detail six rivets like tiny metal buttons had popped out of place. This sparked speculation that shoddy construction might have played a role in the disaster. However, there was a catch. These six missing rivets only covered a small patch on the hull about 12 square feet in total. That's barely a pinprick on the side of a massive ship like the Titanic. While it certainly raised questions about the ship's quality, it seemed unlikely that such a tiny area could be solely responsible for the Titanic's rapid sinking. Adding fuel to the conspiracy fire were the accounts of several survivors who claimed the iceberg did not destroy the ship. Both passengers and crew members who testified before the United States Senate Inquiry Panel swore they hadn't felt any major impact or heard a loud crash when the Titanic hit the iceberg. To them, it seemingly just grazed the side. But here's the twist they all described hearing four distinct reports almost like muffled explosions coming from deep within the ship after it brushed against the ice. The natural explanation was boiler malfunctions or internal pressure issues, but some couldn't help but wonder. Could these have been torpedoes instead? The idea of a sneaky German submarine lurking in the icy waters silently firing on the supposedly unsinkable liner was certainly chilling. Adding to the confusion survivors huddled in lifeboats reported seeing a searchlight in the distance giving them hope for rescue. They believed it came from the Californian another ship nearby but this hope was dashed when Captain Stanley Lord of the Californian firmly denied their claims. He insisted the light wasn't his and that another vessel stood between him and the Titanic. This claim was backed up by some of his crew. They swore they saw an unidentified ship five to six miles away even up until around 2 a.m. Some speculated that it could have been a submarine surfacing after maybe causing the disaster and then vanishing into the night. It's important to note that this wasn't the Carpathia, the real rescue ship that arrived later. The identity of the unknown ship remains a matter of intense debate. Some, particularly in the wake of World War I, suspected it could have been a German U-boat. German submarine technology was indeed advanced in this period and U-boats were known to operate in the North Atlantic. However, there's no concrete evidence to support this claim. The possibility of a deliberate attack or accidental collision with the Titanic remains purely speculative. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. The Titanic, once hailed as the unsinkable marvel of the seas, met its tragic end in the icy waters of the North Atlantic in 1912, claiming over 1,500 lives. Its sinking has been the subject of endless speculation and storytelling for more than a century, with tales ranging from hidden fires and rogue waves to suggestions of deliberate sabotage. While the collision with an iceberg is the officially accepted cause, some voices dissent, suggesting alternative or contributing factors to the disaster. One survivor's account dismisses the iceberg as the sole destroyer, suggesting it may have been merely a minor impact rather than the catastrophic event history records. Critics of the ship's construction argue that the Titanic was not as robust as claimed, pointing to the brittleness of its rivets in the frigid waters as a fatal flaw. Unseen fires within the hull, weakening its structure before the collision, add another layer of mystery and speculation. Then there are those who recount the presence of a mysterious ship in the vicinity, with some going as far as to suggest an act of aggression, like a torpedo strike. The discovery of the wreck in 1985 provided tangible evidence of the Titanic's final moments. Rivets popping, decks collapsing, and the vessel ultimately breaking in two. Yet, even with this evidence, Questions remain about what other unseen forces might have played a role in the tragedy. The shadows of the past hold tight to their secrets, leaving us to ponder. Was the iceberg merely the final straw in a series of catastrophic failures and unfortunate events? We invite you to delve into this enduring mystery and share your thoughts. Was the sinking of the Titanic solely the result of an iceberg collision? Or do you believe other sinister forces were at play? Join the conversation below and help keep the memory of the Titanic alive as we continue to explore the secrets that lie beneath the waves. Chapter 4. Sunk by Pack Ice Many people remember the Titanic sinking after hitting an iceberg in the cold North Atlantic. While that's what most believe Captain L. M. Collins, someone who knew a lot about ice and ships, he wasn't just anyone when it came to ice. He used to work in a special service all about ice dangers for ships. 
Captain Collins looked at three important things witness statements from people who saw the disaster his own experience navigating ships through icy waters and the damage done to the Titanic. Based on all these clues, he came to a surprising conclusion. The Titanic didn't hit a single big iceberg, but something different. He believed it struck a huge area of thick hard ice called pack ice. This pack ice isn't just any ice that's been frozen for years in the Arctic, making it extra strong and dangerous. So instead of one big bump, Captain Collins thought the Titanic might have scraped and crunched along this field of tough ice, causing lots of smaller damages that added up to a big disaster. In his book, The Sinking of the Titanic, Captain Collins dives deeper into the events leading up to the tragedy. He describes how about 10 minutes before the sinking, the lookout saw something strange on the horizon. It looked like a hazy area of white stretching about 20 degrees in both directions from the front of the ship. But Captain Collins argues that this wasn't just regular haze. He believes it was actually a massive stretch of pack ice, a field of thick hardened ice that had been floating in the Arctic for years. The lookouts described the ice as being around 60 feet high, a surprising height, but according to other accounts like Quartermaster Rowe, who saw it from the deck ice right ahead. The fourth officer Boxhall even claimed it was barely above the water. Why these big differences in how high the ice seemed? Captain Collins explains that there's a special trick the icy ocean can play on your eyes. He calls it an optical phenomenon when the sea is flat and the air is incredibly cold things close to the water can look distorted. Imagine if you were standing on a frozen lake it's a bit like a mirage but caused by the cold air messing with how light bends. This is why Captain Collins believes the lookouts overestimated the ice's height. They saw this vast white expanse and tricked by the cold thought it was towering above them. This helps explain why other people observing from different angles or with more experience saw the ice differently. It was all there but the icy ocean was bending the light and playing tricks on their eyes. Captain Collins didn't just rely on witness statements, he also brought science into the picture. He argued that something called the Bernoulli effect proves the Titanic couldn't have hit a big iceberg like everyone believes. Imagine you are blowing on a paper cup with all your might, the harder you blow the more the cup lifts, right? Captain Collins explained that water works the same way. If the Titanic had smashed into a giant iceberg at its full speed, the water around the impact would have acted like a powerful wind trying to lift the ice up would have caused the ice to break apart and slide along the Titanic side like a big icy cheese grater scraping against the hull. Now if the iceberg truly was the size of a hotel the scraping wouldn't just leave a few scratches it would have ripped the entire side of the Titanic open. Would have sunk the ship instantly not in the agonizing two hours it actually took. It's an intriguing theory and one that adds another layer of mystery to the already tragic story of the Titanic. Whether it's the true explanation or not, it highlights the challenges and dangers of navigating through icy waters. Chapter 3. The Hidden Message In the aftermath of almost every terrible event, whispers start swirling around. People talk about how someone somewhere could have seen it coming if they just knew what to pay attention to. It's like these big tragedies leave ghosts behind ghosts made of what-ifs and if-onlys. We hear it after assassinations when people point out strange things the victim said or did just before. We hear it after earthquakes with rumors of unusual animal behavior or weird weather patterns days in advance. Even plane crashes get caught up in it with talk of bad dreams or unsettling feelings someone had before boarding. The sinking of the Titanic was no different. There were stories floating around each one spookier than the last. One popular one said the ship's hull number was actually a hidden message. The story about the Titanic's hull number isn't like most disaster predictions. It doesn't just say bad things were written after the tragedy. This one claims some people saw a warning sign before the ship even sailed. They say people working on the Titanic in Belfast, mostly Catholics, saw a bad omen in the number painted on its side. These workers thought the number was a nasty message against their religion, something put there by their Protestant bosses. They were so upset they even stopped working for a while. They refused to put another rivet in until the bosses promised it was all just a coincidence, a weird trick of the numbers, and the mirror not some deliberate anti-Catholic plot. The number Harland and Wolf gave the Titanic was 390904. Now normally that wouldn't be anything special, but here's the twist. When you write that number in longhand and then flip it like you're looking in a mirror, suddenly it spells out something shocking, no Pope. And for these Catholic workers, that was a big deal. 
Now hold on before we get swept away by this no pope mystery. Let's step back and see if the legend actually holds water. To be true, it needs two things, the Titanic's number really being 390,904 and its workers freaking out over it. Well, the first part falls apart straight away. 390904 wasn't the Titanic special code or anything. Official records show her number as 131428 and the shipyard itself called her 401. No secret, no Pope number hiding there. The second part crumbles too. Turns out most of the workers at Harland and Wolfe, where the Titanic was built, weren't Catholic. They were mainly Protestant, so this idea of spooky messages spooking them doesn't really add up. So while the no Pope story might sound dramatic, it lacks the basic ingredients to be true. The numbers don't match, and the people it supposedly affected wouldn't have cared anyway. It's more like a whisper in the wind than a hidden clue etched in steel. But hey, that doesn't mean the Titanic story is all boring facts and figures. Plenty of real things about its construction and fate are fascinating enough. Let's explore those instead of chasing phantom messages in the mirror. Chapter 2. The Fire Not only did the Titanic face the icy threat of the North Atlantic, but there were rumors about a hidden danger within its very belly. Some believed that a fire sparked within one of the ship's massive coal bunkers had been smoldering away for days before the fateful journey even began. These fires common on coal-powered ships due to spontaneous combustion were no small matter. Crew members battled the blaze with hoses shifting the burning coal around and even shoveling it directly into the furnaces to quell the flames. This hidden fire has ignited the imaginations of some leading them to theorize that it may have played a role in the tragedy. Beyond simply being a nuisance, some suggest the intense heat weakened the ship's steel hull, making it more vulnerable to the iceberg's impact. Others point to a critical bulkhead separating compartments theorizing that the fire's damage could have compromised its ability to contain the floodwaters after the collision. Some also suspect that shoveling the burning coal into the ship's furnaces pushed the Titanic to maintain its high speed despite warnings of icebergs. However, most experts cast doubt on this theory. Samuel Halpern, a Titanic expert, debunks the notion that the fire could have significantly weakened the watertight bulkhead, making it vulnerable to collapse. He points out that the ship's construction and compartmentalization were designed to withstand such internal pressures. While the fire's true influence on the Titanic's fate remains a topic of debate, one thing is clear it adds another layer of complexity to this already captivating and tragic story. Chapter 1. Racing Towards Tragedy Captain Edward Smith, whose name is forever etched in history alongside the Titanic, wasn't just the captain of the ill-fated ship. He was a seasoned sailor with a long and successful career at sea, but the shadow of the Titanic's demise clings to his memory fueled by whispers and rumors that swirl after that fateful night. Many pointed fingers at Captain Smith, laying the blame for the tragedy at his feet. Some claimed he was pressured by the White Star Line, the Titanic's owner, to maintain a high speed despite the dangers lurking in the icy waters. Others believed he ignored warnings from other ships about the looming threat of icebergs. These accusations were serious and both the United States and the United Kingdom launched official inquiries to investigate the disaster. Did the White Star Line prioritize speed over safety? Did Captain Smith disregard crucial warnings? Were there any actions that could have prevented the tragedy? When it comes to the Titanic's fateful journey, the question of speed has remained a burning ember. Many believe she sped recklessly toward her doom with Captain Smith blamed for pushing the engines despite the risks. The official inquiries delve deep into this particularly weather J. Bruce Ismay, the White Star Line's boss, pressured Smith to keep up the pace. Here's what the investigations revealed. While the Titanic was indeed moving fast, she never reached her full potential. Unlike popular belief, Captain Smith wasn't chasing records or aiming for an excessively quick crossing. The British inquiry, after carefully examining evidence, concluded that Smith steered the ship according to established practices for someone of his experience. In other words, the speed, though significant, was not considered unreasonable for a well-equipped vessel like the Titanic in those times. This doesn't mean speed wasn't a factor in the tragedy. The inquiry acknowledged that a slower ship might have had more time to maneuver around the iceberg, but it also highlighted other contributing factors such as the lack of effective lookout procedures and the outdated regulations regarding lifeboats. The mystery surrounding the Titanic's fate extended beyond the question of speed. Doubts also swirled around Captain Smith's handling of ice warnings. 
Fourth Officer Joseph Boxhall, a key witness, shed light on this question. He revealed that he and Captain Smith plotted the coordinates of early ice warnings carefully aware of the potential dangers lurking in their path. These early warnings were heeded and course adjustments were made. However, as the night wore on more ice warnings flooded in but they never reached Captain Smith's ears. Why? The Titanic's Marconi radio system overburdened with passenger traffic simply couldn't handle the influx of urgent messages. These crucial warnings got stuck in the telegraph room, their life-saving information never reaching the ears that needed it most. The stories surrounding Captain Smith's final moments aboard the Titanic have also taken on a life of their own woven from fragments of memory and the fog of tragedy. Some like the tale of him rescuing a baby before returning to the sinking ship paint him as a hero. Others whispering of suicide by pistol cast him in a darker light. However, the majority of accounts offer a simpler, more somber picture. They speak of Captain Smith standing on the bridge as the Titanic plunged into the icy depths. Eyewitnesses claim they saw him dive into the frigid water, choosing to go down with his ship. While we may never know for sure what transpired in Captain Smith's final moments, one thing is certain. Captain Edward Smith, along with more than 1,500 others, met his end in the cold embrace of the North Atlantic on that fateful night of April 15, 1912. His body remains lost to the sea. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.